Welcome to this lecture on organizations, um, groups, and how we connect uh, in our sense of the larger bureaucracy and the titles that we give that. Emil Durkheim said the only power that can decrease the egoism is the strength of the group. And I want you to think about that for a moment. When you have an individual idea, if you have the support of a group, a lot of times that will bolster your sense of confidence in that. However, if you have an opposing uh, idea compared to groups that mean something to you or give you some sort of status or some sort of uh, understanding of your social identity, maybe even your personal identity, um, you will keep the group in mind when you make decisions. So that's what this week is all about and how we label that. So what is a social group? Our textbook defines it this way. It's a collection of people who regularly interact with one another on the basis of shared expectations concerning behavior and who share a sense of identity. This doesn't mean it has to be a, a super personal group. Um, there's a lot of times that social groups are meeting because, for example, you might have a team that you do uh, some sort of rec group with. Um, or maybe you are in a classroom. That's a social group in some aspects. There are some shared expectations of getting through the class, just like this online class. And there's sometimes very personal groups that you are connected to, maybe they're friends or family. But all of these are considered in some way a social group. Think of all the social groups that you might be part of. I want you to take a moment to try to count all the social groups. Close friends, sports teams, clubs, sororities, fraternities, common interest groups, um, really in every aspect of life, unless we're by ourselves in a room, there's a lot of times that we'll find ourselves in a group. Now sometimes we'll be with two people. That's not considered a group. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Social groups are made up of two types, the primary type and the secondary group. The primary group is the group that you put most of your um, energy into and your sense of when you make a decision or start to think about how it would affect others, your primary group is usually the one you turn to to consider. The secondary group is often a group that you may or may not feel very close to. You may choose to not show up. You may not uh, really care about the opinion of the secondary group. Talk a little bit more about how that plays out. Once again, the book says the primary group is a group characterized by intense emotional ties. So that's the first thing you have to keep in mind, that you have some sort of feelings about these people. Uh, the face-to-face -face interaction, the intimacy, that strong, enduring sense of commitment, that comes from long-term relationships. So your family, your friends, people who would be in your wedding, for example, if you chose to have a wedding, or let's say we're sending out invitations for a graduation, who are those people that you would want to be there? People who know the most about you. That's the other thing about a primary group. They have a strong sense of who you are because you are most likely not doing impression management in a way with them that is presenting a false self. And if you remember that from a couple lectures back, that this has uh, a sense of you really being backstage with them and being able to be connected in a way. And you have that probably same exact relationship with them. So that's a primary group. A secondary group is characterized usually large in size by impersonal fleeting relationships. There's a specific goal in mind. So sports teams members, for example, let's say you're playing football um, in high school. Um, you may have four years with people that you're on the team, but you're not gonna be best friends with every single person on the team. You may have very close primary group friends within that team, but the larger team as a whole may not necessarily be somebody who you keep in contact for the rest of your life. Classmates, depends on the season in your life. You may have gotten connected with certain classmates uh, in elementary school, then maybe you moved to a junior high or a senior high that was different, and those types of relationships changed. All of these types of groups that are secondary are ones that you wouldn't be too upset if you had to leave. That's the best way to say it. There's not a large amount of emotional tie, but you may have fond memories of being part of those groups. There's also different types of groups and how we feel where we belong or don't belong. And this is uh, different than just primary and secondary. This is that sense of loyalty and your primary group may be an in-group, but typically these are the most people um, that you consider we with. But there's also a problem sometimes with in-groups. And so uh, let's think about that for a second. An in-group is one where you feel that sense of loyalty it's a respect, a we factor, you feel superior. This can be your friends, but this can also be maybe a political party. 
Maybe you're connected to a political party and you feel like your party is the best party. That's an in-group. So everybody outside of that political party is part of what we would call the out-group, which we'll talk about in a second. I want you to take a moment to think again, how many in-groups are you in? What are the groups that make you feel like you belong? Um, for example, are there particular uh, groups that are your sororities, fraternities, those types of things where you had to pledge to get into them? Um, scouts can sometimes feel like an in-group. Um, it just depends on the types of, of things you've had to do, but usually you've had to do some sort of uh, initiation or some sense of belonging to the group based on your beliefs and values. Therefore, an out-group is that which you feel antagonism toward because they're not part of that group. This can often run into racial issues and racial tensions because often we connect ourselves through our in-groups and out-groups based on racial labels that either we've accepted or haven't. Um, a lot of times we receive that out-group treatment depending on you know, things like gender, those types of things as well. So it doesn't have to be something that um, you automatically are aware of. It's that sense of the feeling, once again, whether you feel belonging and loyalty versus antagonism, because they, this group may be different than the norms, the values, or even familiarity. Um, so there's a lot of times we have to be careful about the in and out groups. We're talking about groups, we also have different forms of power that are distributed. For example, oligarchy is a small group, maybe a very strong, powerful in-group that will run an organization, sometimes even run government and society. Oligarchies have been part of national uh, governments in some form or another, uh, where people are not considered part of the democracy, but this is uh, maybe a special task force team or a particular, uh, economic um, teams that are brought together. Recently, I was listening, for example, on NPR about Puerto Rico, and there's a current finance team that is overseeing the restructuring of the country. And there's a lot of controversy about how this outside team is economically shaping uh, the welfare of this country, and if it's keeping in mind the out-group or in-groups um, that would be created in that. So an oligarchy is usually ruled by a very small minority and often have to be watched because they do have a lot of power. We've talked about conformity before and there is a video that goes along with that and has um, shown how we are easily we conforming people because that's what we do. We're socialized to try to conform. But once again, when we look at groups and organizations, we have to recognize we conform to an organization. That's why when you get a job and do that impression management, to try to get the job. Usually you can figure out how you're gonna to conform to the group and you may find out, hey, you dressed up for the job, you start showing up for work and you notice, hey, everybody's work casual. They don't have to wear a tie all the time. So you go along then and submit to new rules and expectations. But the expected rules that you had before were to give that sense of your, your impression so you could get into that group and then therefore conform. There's lots of ways we do this with um, our friends. We conform. A lot of times we will conform in our language, conform in the way in which we're expected to treat each other. That type of conformity can be found in all levels of our life, but especially when we're working with groups. Unfortunately, there are times, and there's a video attached to this week's module, where people have uh, experienced hazing. <laughs> that is different than initiation. Initiation is something that is often considered a timed honored ritual. But when it comes to creating harassment, abuse, or humiliation, that turns to hazing. A lot of times we see, especially on college universities, uh, strong emphasis on talking to groups about their initiation practices and making sure that nobody is hazed. I'm going to ask you to consider when you see the video this week on hazing, uh, whether or not you consider that a hazing or not. That will be part of our discussion this week, so you're going to have to watch that video. Um, and then also to make sure that you're aware of how um, that line can be pretty fine, because there may be some people that, you know, consent, and it may not be hazing, so it's hard to tell. Sometimes you need some sort of an idea of what you know, you belong to as a group or, or some sort of a reference as to how you're going to judge an outcome or a decision. 
when we talk about a reference group, it provides a standard ju of judging one's attitudes and behaviors. This is often used in times where people are religious or they have some sort of cultural uh, background. For example, if you're part of a Jewish community, you may use that community as a reference group for determining whether it's okay to eat ham or not. Or you may uh, use some sort of a cultural group to determine how you uh, dress. So maybe you are uh, part of an Arabic community, you may not be Islamic, but you like to wear things that are a little bit more conservative or um, a sense of covering more. It's what we do when we look to for definitions of how we're gonna present ourselves, often our values and norms and practices. Sometimes a reference group can be the culture of a small town community versus a large city community. So it's something that you have to consider as to who are you thinking of when you're trying to make the impression. And also maybe how would you like to make this decision and how would it maybe affect um, others? And so you use what you've learned from the reference group to make that decision. The last lecture we talked about the focus interaction and unfocused interaction and we've talked about that civil in intention. Um, this is where most of that happens is in large groups. Group is group interaction is you know usually that sense of unfocused um, interaction unless you're focused on a particular thing um, for example bringing back football team basketball team volleyball team you're focused on the game but um, it's it's sometimes unfocused you're not necessarily talking to a person directly you're engaged in that larger practice and this is the kind of groups we find ourselves in every single day Focused interaction then usually happens, once again, as I mentioned earlier, in a small group. So if you are in a group of two, which is not really a group, we call that a dyad. It's where two people uh, decide to be in a conversation and they're focused on each other. And that is not necessarily a group, it's, it's what we call a dyad. A triad is where you have three people. Once again, we often don't consider three people a group. We consider that a small group uh, or small uh, conversation between three people and enough so you can still have that focused interaction. Anything beyond the triad is considered usually a group. Therefore, unfocused interaction and civil intention, those places where we're not paying attention to the person or listening, being in large groups is called often a social aggregate. Those are the titles of the groups that we're in. So a collection of people who happen to be gather, together in a particular place but do not significantly interact or identify with one another. It could be people that are on the same building in an office building. You could be in a doctor's office, you're in a social aggregate. If you're at a large concert, you're in a social aggregate. Um, it means that if something happened, let's say um, a fire broke out, suddenly all of these people are connected and you are all probably sharing your story with anybody who is investigating the fire. You're part of a social aggregate where you're not significantly interacting with each other, but you are experiencing that group interaction of being present together. So that's how I'd look at that one. Resting somewhere in between is what we call a network. Networks are often explained in the most uh, common form on social media. You are part of networks always if you're part of the social media game. Not all of us do that, but if you are part of the social media world, think of Reddit. That is a network. It's a set of informal and formal social ties that link people to one another. You may be following a particular person on Reddit or a group, and you're interacting probably with the same people who are following. This can be part of Facebook, Snapchat, any of those types of places. But also networks can be involved around your organization. Um, let's say I'm a sociologist. I, I often hang out on sites or go to places where sociologists gather and learn from each other. I don't necessarily hang out or loyal. I don't feel like I'm necessarily completely in an in-group because some of us as sociologists might disagree. But I am part of a network where there are many of those interactions going on, sometimes a social aggregate feeling, and also sometimes there's a sense of that civil um, intention where we're all kind of present, but there's also focused interaction where you might find somebody that you're really interested in, for example, at a convention, talk to them and get to know them. Networks have lots of different levels, um, and it's often involved in you being able to create some social ties that might make a difference for you later on. 
And that's when we come to weak ties and social ties. Social ties are often, once again, you have strong social ties with your primary groups and typically your in groups. There's a lot of times where you feel that sense of continued connection with those groups. But every once in a while you have a weak tie where you're connected with somebody, maybe through a friend or through some other person. For example, I know a person who was the piano player for Justin Bieber. Um, I don't know Justin Bieber, but I know Justin Bieber's piano player. That's what would be called a weak tie. Justin Bieber would not know who Jan Todd is, but this person that I know knows who I am. These are very formal and sometimes used in that network or connected group. On a larger scale, you may actually use different weak ties to help you with jobs or interviews. Think about people that you might put on as a reference. That person might be connected with other people that have really strong influence in the area you're interested in. And so those weak ties are important to make known to other people. Once again, that's that impression management that you're looking for. Organization is a word we use for group. It is a large group of individuals with a definite set of uh, rules and authority regulations. Many types of organizations exist in industrial society, and even though not all of them are bureaucratic. So we're part of organizations. Anytime you see the title organization, by the way, that means it's an organization. Um, anything with .org, probably an organization. These are large uh, groups that we may be part of professionally or in the, I even think of things like Comic-Con, that's an organization. Um, things that you do for your free time, um, maybe to go to a festival, let's say a music festival or something like that. The people organizing that are an organization typically. This can also be large groups that make things happen. For example, social movements. Greenpeace, NRA, NAACP, those are all organizations. Businesses like John Deere, Sprint, City Corps, organizations. Common Interest, Catbackers, Alumni Association. You get the picture. These are organizations. But there are different forms in which we look at them. There's the formal organization, which means it has a rationally designed objective about what the explicit rules are. So you can maybe be part of a group that's an organization, but there's not like bylaws or anything like that going on. However, a formal organization will absolutely have bylaws. So let's think about that in the terms of like a university. Universities definitely have not only that sense of formality, but they also have specific rules about inclusivity. Title IX, for example. Every person that teaches, every student that goes through has to go through some sort of training at most of our state organizations. Um, and they're very formal. There's explicit rules about what will happen or what won't happen if you don't comply. Most large businesses are formal organizations. There's codes of conduct. There are procedures. If something has um, gone awry or if somebody needs to be corrected in their behavior. Organizations that are most known at that formal level are governments, but we'll talk a little bit about that since because they go into this next level, which is called a bureaucracy. Do you think of bureaucracy as the word itself, you break it down and it's a bureau. Um, a bureau is like a big, it's a name for a French set of drawers that are often used to put different things in and organize it. Often it was a big desk, so you had papers, pencils, lots of different places, little tiny, think of those really French looking things with little tiny places to put things. Well, that's what a bureaucracy is, is very clear, distinctive organization of where things go and there's a clear hierarchy of authority in the existence of written rules and procedures where it's staff full time and there's a lot of salaried officials. When you think of that bureaucracy, you also have to think of the chair, it's part of the bureau. And who's sitting in the chair is often those who in power who are organizing what goes in those places and maybe what comes out. So it's a big idea. Colleges, university systems are formal organizations, but they're also bureaucracies because they tend to be huge in their uh, amount of written rules, procedures, and a sense of people keeping those in place, which we often call administration. That's the end of talking about groups today. I hope that you got a clearer understanding of not just how we interact like we talked last week, but how those interactions turn into groups, organizations, both primary and secondary. If you need any questions answered, feel free to text me 913-553-0267. Have a good week.